Okay, we'll make a start, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Phil Kelly. I'm from a, an organization called Pronoctis, and we've partnered with High Five this evening to, to bring you a great webinar with a fantastic guest. But before we, we get into the main main questions and discussions and Q&A with Vicky, uh, I'll just hand you over to Gemma from High Five just to do a short introduction in terms of how these have come about and why High Five have started them. So over to you, Gemma. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're delighted to obviously have you all here today. Uh, for the live event with Vicky. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce myself because I am I'm the representative for High Five. So I'm responsible for delivering the High Five Clubs program. And as a uh, part of my background is I'm I'm also, well, I'm a retired elite athlete. So I used to compete in track and field. Uh, I went to Beijing Olympics. Uh, my other half, who I'm now married to, he's Chris Thompson. He's also an elite athlete, so he runs the marathon and is trying to... He, he was actually in 2012 Olympics with Mo Farah in the 10K. Um, he's now shooting for the next Olympics in the marathon. So that's a little bit about me, but just to give you a background, because I'm obviously the point of contact for the clubs in the, high, in the clubs rewards scheme. So just about that. So that's what's enabled to bring this event to you tonight. Um, for those that don't know, we, we've set up a clubs reward scheme that's about uh, inspiring, educating, and working with clubs at grassroots level, because that's what High Five's about. It's about working with grassroots. Um, so we, uh, as part of that program, we are helping clubs to fund projects and things so they're raising money and funding things that are important to the club so uh, these could be anything from buying the club new equipment to um, uh, making a charitable donation or funding a volunteer coach and things like that so if you want to find out anything any more information about it it's all on our website but that was just to give you a brief overview of why we're here tonight and what this is all about but I don't want to go on for too long so obviously over to the main event and Vicky. Um, as you know, Vicky is the first ever British female triathlete medalist in the Olympics. Great, great news for a uh, British triathlon. Great feat. So well done to you, Vicky. She's been with High Five for just over four years. And I believe your favorite product is the Energy Bar Berry flavor. <laughs> That'd be right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I got that right. So over to you guys. Um, enjoy the show, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Gemma. And uh, obviously, a big thank you to High Five as well for, for the opportunity tonight. Uh, Vicky, where should we start? Where should we start? <laughs> I think, um, think it would be amiss not to sort of tip our cap, I think, to the, to the environment we're in at the minute. All of us as human beings, whether you're at a grassroots club, whether you're a coach, an athlete, or an elite athlete like yourself, How's it been for you? How's 2020 been for you? <laughs> oh God, how long have we got? Um, that's that's a whole story in itself, isn't it? This uh, this year has been ridiculous for so many people in so many ways. So heartbreaking in so many ways. A real probably roller coaster for me. Um, it started off really well with a really great camp in Australia. Um, that was our kind of winter. It's obviously not winter in Australia, our winter camp ahead of the summer season. And that went really, really well. I put in probably my biggest ever block of training, most consistent amount of work, uh, managed to squeeze a race in um, and a World Cup race in Malula Bar, which I won, which was much better than I thought I would perform. I hadn't really started doing the, the real high intensity stuff yet. So I was really, really pleased and encouraged with that, full of sort of positivity for what was to come. Um, flew back to the UK and five days later, lockdown happened. Uh, the day after that, the Olympics got canceled. So that was a real kind of head mess <laughs> um, for me on the basis that yes okay there was this much bigger picture at the time of oh my gosh what is happening in this world um but for me personally I was gearing up for this Olympics something that I've always said would be my last Olympics um a winter that I thought would be my last really really massive winter and I felt like kind of I'd the, the ending was in sight for that for that event and then the goalpost didn't just get moved they got moved into a different park um, so for me through the, the sort of spring months, 
I spoke with my 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 now husband, who's also my uh, coach, and we decided that for me the best kind of path forward wasn't to really hammer the home training try and do tons and tons of hours on the indoor turbo on the bike trainer wasn't to try and just be as fit as possible all year we decided to really just step off the gas um for me I think I'm an athlete who works really well when I've got a very clear goal and I'm also an athlete who's not in my younger years anymore so uh it's not like I'm I'm lacking that volume of endurance in my background so we decided the best thing for me going into next year would be to just take my foot off foot off the gas a little bit so I had about two months where I really I was I wouldn't say I was training I was exercising um and to a, to a nice level, a level that maybe one day when I'm not an elite athlete anymore, I really enjoy. Um, I did that for a couple of months and then we got to sort of middle of May and I decided it was, I felt ready. It was time to start building up. There was hope that there might be some races coming at the end of the season. Um, so tentatively we started building up the training again, uh, got back into a pool in, oh, that had been late June I think it was almost three months out of a pool um again started to build up the training and again we had to make a decision how hard we we wanted to go did we want to go back into the 30 hour weeks did we want to just kind of um kind of go two thirds three quarters of the way there but not all the way and for me when I'm in full training that pretty much takes everything um it's 30 hours a week and it's it's a lot of volume um because we know that's what works best for me and I didn't feel that I could commit to that knowing that there probably wasn't well quite possibly wasn't going to be much racing to come off it so we kind of went in 80 percent you know I was doing maybe 25 hours a week rather than 30 um got myself into a relative state of fitness um and the race that we were hoping to happen the race in Hamburg that ended up becoming our world championship race did happen we only got told it was going to be a world champs 10 days out which was interesting um and I knew I probably wasn't in the shape to really go and contend. Had I known all summer it was going to be a world champs, then I think I probably would have gone back up to that 100% level of training, at least for a good two months or so. Um, so I went there slightly underdone um, and definitely got a bit shown up because I was a bit underdone. But the whole point of going there really was to get a hit out. Um, if I didn't race then, I wasn't going to race probably for a full year. Uh, from March this year till at least March next year, we hope, if the races happen as we plan. Um, so I went there, raced very averagely, left it there um, and decided to sort of call my season quits and then uh, start afresh, really. And here we are again in another lockdown. This one's very different for us in elite sport. We're very lucky that we can still access pools and gym facilities. So um, for me, life actually hasn't changed that much during lockdown. I can't meet up with many people and I can't do all the fun stuff that maybe I'd want to do. But uh, my actual professional life is very much as it would be in a normal you know, day to day. Um, so I'm able to really get stuck in. And I think this time around, we're almost a lot more prepared for it. We know what it doesn't feel like such a shock. It doesn't feel like the world's ending. It does, you know, it feels more like we're, we're accustomed to this. I know how to get through this now. Um, and I've very much got the goal of summer 2021 on my, on my radar. And I'm sort of knuckling down for a, for a big winter, whether that means I have to do the winter in the UK, um, then so be it. Here we go. <laughs> there's, there's so many follow-up questions from that to be honest with you so let, let's, Sorry. Let, no no not at all well we spoke earlier on in the year and, and lockdown had just happened hadn't it? And, and the world was very yeah. very different there's a lot more you know unknowns in terms of moving forward and I think you know to chatting to you now and reflecting back on on the year you've had you're talking about you know you took your foot off the gas for that that period of a month or two was there any sort of added benefits from from relaxing a little bit and just going out and exercising rather than training yeah definitely I think I mean as I sort of said I'm I'm someone who I, I started swimming when I was six. I started running um, as soon as I went to secondary school. So I'd been 11. Um, I've done triathlon since I was 19. I'm now 34. Um, I went straight from university into professional triathlon. So I've been doing it professionally for well over a decade. I've been doing triathlon itself for 15 years at quite a high intensity. So Yes, every year we take a bit of downtime at the end of the season, but I've never had a prolonged break from from actually training. And I am at that point in my life where I'm sort of ready to, to do that, to step back every now and again. And that's OK. And it is different for everyone. I think what the first lockdown showed us was that everyone dealt with that differently. 
some people, especially I think probably the younger athletes, the ones who are a bit more, a bit fresher, a bit more gung ho, a bit more, you know, wanting to see those improvements that they can make in those, 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 those months when no one's watching, um, went really hard. And for me, I felt like, well, I've done that for years and I, I don't think mentally I would have fared too well had I just really plowed on. So for me, I really think having that, taking that step back, feeling fresh, feeling ready to go again was really beneficial, especially because I knew I was going to have to go into another winter. And winter is hard as a triathlete. Like, let's not beat around the bush. It is hard as a triathlete, especially if you're going to be in the UK all the time. Um, the biggest thing I always say is the lack of daylight hours. It, it kills me um, trying to fit in those, those sessions squashed in. And we are a country that has a massive restriction in daylight hours. Um, so when, you know, for height of summer, you could pretty much train all day if you wanted to. You could go for a run at nine o'clock at night and you wouldn't be in the dark. But in the summer, sorry, in the winter, you have to be out for your run by 3, 3.30. And then even then you're coming back probably with a head torch or hoping for street lamps or, you know, it, it, it is hard. So definitely taking my foot off the gas for those six to eight weeks. I think has meant that I'm in a better place now to really commit to this winter, knowing that truthfully, I'm probably not going to get to do a camp on the other side of the world as I've been lucky to do over the last few years. I mean, I think the last three winters in a row, I've done Australia this year, just gone South Africa the year before and the year before I did both South Africa and Australia because we had Commonwealth Games. So I've been really lucky in that period, sort of between January, March, April time, where we kind of, evacuate a little bit um this year it's probably not going to happen and we're, we're we're very much you know we we are accepting of that that we're we're going to have to tackle it in the uk um we might be able to sneak out here and there maybe a little trip to the canaries and things like that but there's not going to be a four-week camp in australia that's not going to happen um and that does mean that there's going to be extra challenges but i definitely think that having that break earlier on this year meant that when it was time to go which for me was really right at the beginning of october took sort of most of september off after hamburg i feel like i feel like i'm ready now i feel like i've I feel like I've got got enough to I, get to get through. I, I can sense it. I can I can sense honestly. It's coming across. You're like you're chomping at the bit now to get these good solid. Yeah. Blocks, so I've, the bag. yeah. I've just finished my first sort of. I built through October. Then November we started hitting it pretty hard. Um, and I've just finished like my first big block of training. I'm having a sort of easier few days, and then we're going in again. And yeah, I feel I feel really good off that. And at the moment, fingers crossed, the weather's being quite good to us. It's not been terrible. Um, so if it could stay like this, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's get into a bit more of the finer detail around that then. So you're saying that things have kicked off in October for yourself and obviously you, you're, you're building up your blocks now. And I, give us a bit more information. So in terms of you said you, you know what works for you, you know, individualized 30 hours a week. Talk, run us through, you know, your, your typical week when you're up to 30 hours, uh, everything from, you know, what activity you're doing, how long are you spending on it, what nutrition you're having and how you're replenishing to make sure that you can go again the next day? Sure. So each day is different. Um, I think that probably goes without saying, but we tend to keep a weekly pattern that's roughly the same. Um, and there'll be some days that are much more aerobic and some days where there's a bit more intensity popped in there. At the moment, I'm not doing very much intensity in any of the three sports. Um, for me, I am someone who I'm a bit more of a petrol engine by nature um, and triathlon in general tends to lend itself to diesels. So I've kind of had to cross over a bit and become a bit more diesel. And that means that I have to spend much more time just developing my engine than some of the other more natural diesels have to do. So that's why for me right now, a lot of my time is spent low aerobic long hours. That's kind of what I've got to do. Um, that said, there is still, you know, a few pops of intensity in there, mostly in the swim and the cycle at the moment. I won't start doing any run sessions until January. Um, and even then, probably one a week uh, might start slotting in two a week, maybe from March time onwards. Um, and, and most elite triathletes tend to do two harder runs a week. Um, and I was doing that up until probably this last winter just gone uh, when we started to shift my focus a little bit. And actually, I performed really well in Malulabar there um, off one run session a week. So I think we know I can do that. We're just trying to work on the other areas, which I'm potentially not as strong in. Uh, in terms of what the days look like, um, or rather the breakdown, I should say, of the hours across the week, uh, I tend to do somewhere around 16 hours on the bike. 
Um, in a really big week, I'd push that up to 18, but somewhere around 16, if I can hold that consistently through the winter, then that tends to get me where I need to go. Um, and the swim, I swim five times a week for roughly an hour and a half each time. One or two of them might be a bit longer. So that nudges up to about eight hours a week. Um, running, I don't run very much. Um, I run four to four and a half hours. Uh, then we start nudging that a little bit higher as we go through the year. When we get towards the more racing months, I start nudging that up again and I probably get up to sort of seven to eight hours, but I never really go above that. Um, I don't really work in mileage um, simply because I do a lot of it very slowly. So, and I don't believe that actually it matters how far you've gone. It's the time on your feet and uh, the time on the bike, for example, on uh, when you're when you're riding, that's more important. I'd rather be like, I'm going for a four hour ride than trying to say I'll do 100 Ks because 100 Ks, 100 K and this 100 K is not even, you know, 100 K is, is this and 100 K is this with no wind and it's completely different. So I work to time a lot more um, than I do than I do mileage. Um, in terms of my recovery, yeah, I think in the winter, the biggest thing is recognizing the really big days. So the really big days are the big volume days. For me, that's a Wednesday. Usually I do a long ride, um, a pretty long swim as well, um, and a, a little run uh, just to sort of really round off the day. So that could easily be a six plus hour day, um, a lot of time in the saddle. So those are the days where I think it's really important to make sure that you're bringing in some extra protein in the evening. Um, that's, that's a really big thing to note. I think some people only think to add protein in after a hard session, but one of the things we, um, our nutritionist at British triathlon was really hot on, um, sort of hammering home with us was that, actually the days where you just do a lot of exercise even if it's low intensity those long hours will really leach it out of you and that's when you need to start putting it back in again um so long day like for me a wednesday um a saturday or a sunday is quite often those are quite long days as well i tend to ride long on both of those days and i'll long run and long ride on a sunday so after that again a good a good protein shake at the end of the day um making sure you're fuel, fueled consistently throughout the day as well i think um as a triathlete, there are some people have different schools of thought on, you know, doing certain activities fasted. I don't do very much fasted at all anymore. Um, I just think for my consistency over a week, over two weeks, over a whole month of a block of training, it doesn't help me to be fasted for one or two sessions. Actually, if I can continually be eating, eating those berry bars, which are my favorite product, you know, um, quite like the caramel ones as well, just keeping that in on a, on a regular basis, trying to eat on the bike. I tend to try and eat between every hour to hour and a half on the bike to try and get something in. Um, that just means that you're never getting to a point of being so depleted that you can't come back because once you tip over that edge, it's really hard to come back. And everyone who rides will know the term bonking. You don't ever want to bonk on the bike because as soon as you do that, it takes, it doesn't just take a meal to get you back there. It could take two or three days to get you back there. And realistically, the key to triathlon is trying to be consistent and you can't be consistent if you've not got the energy and the fuel behind you to do it. So those are probably the products I'd rely on to, to eat my way through. But on top of that, pretty much every drink I have has electrolytes in it. Um, someone once said to me, and it kind of really resonated, you don't sweat out water, so why would you drink it? Um, and I think that's really important as well when you're doing the high intensity stuff when it's hot, because you do tend to sweat out a lot more of the, of the salts from your body. And I think something I never used to realize as well is that when it is hot, you, you leach salt from your bones, you just leach calcium out of your bones. So really, if you can just be putting that back in all the time, that's really, really important. I mean, I've got, I'm drinking it at the moment. This is, um, this is this actually berry. What have I got here? Berry high five zero these and I'm pretty much always always with these I used to have the um pink grapefruit ones but I don't think they don't think they make those anymore so I'm on berry now these are my favorites now um but yeah so basically if you can just always be sipping on uh, sipping on electrolytes that's good and I'm also a nightmare in the winter for not drinking too much um in the summer I will be chugging away at the fluids but in the winter I'm, I can go on a four hour ride. And if someone doesn't remind me, I might take one sip of water on the, on the four hour ride. There's no way that even when it's Baltic, I'm not sweating out more than that. 
and it really helps to have something with a little bit of flavoring on the bike because if it's just water you're not as tempted to drink it whereas if you have got something with that little bit of flavor which is where the high five zero comes in then it's just a little bit easier to to make sure you're you're, you're taking it in I think I think all the cyclists on the call were probably smiling then in terms of the, the winter cycling and getting the miles in and, and you, you concentrate more on staying warm sometimes but then you, you do hit that wall don't you sometimes you know depending on what your, your pre nutrition's like sometimes That's it's 19 it. minutes in of a four-hour ride and you're struggling and you say I'm, I'm fine I'm fine everyone's sort of saying oh, I'm just gonna have a stop for a banana or a bar or something else oh no I don't need one I'm fine I'm fine and then 20 minutes later you're the one who's in trouble yeah, so you've yeah. almost got to preempt it with 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 nutrition with hydration it's both the same you have to preempt it all the time have you have you truly mastered your nutrition that works for you now and, and if you have what when when did this sort of click for you um, I think I've adapted it a bit, you know, as I've got older, um, I think I've worked out the importance. I never, I never used to touch protein. Um, and it wasn't because I had like a, I didn't think, oh, if I have protein powder, I'm going to get big or it wasn't anything to do with that. I just didn't think I needed it. Um, and I've always, I always used to be very much like, oh, I don't need to take any products. I don't want anything artificial in me. I don't want, um, I don't want to take vitamin supplements, anything like that. But I think as I've got older, and I, I do look at the research out there. It's things like, you know, the vitamin D research that is super strong to say that you need that. The calcium that I've talked about that leaches from your bones, loads of stuff like that, that I'm, I'm quite interested in now. Um, and I think I've kind of, I'm less stubborn. I've realized that actually I need to allow these products to help me be my best, which they, they absolutely can do. Um, I think, like I said, I've refined things as I go. Um, I've dabbled with caffeine gels on and off because caffeine is something that I don't have huge amounts of caffeine in my diet because I don't drink, I don't drink coffee. Um, I do drink tea, which obviously does have a much smaller amount of caffeine in. Um, so caffeine sometimes plays a bit with my stomach. So that's something that I've, particularly with race day nutrition, I've played around with a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably almost even now ever evolving. But for a good few years now, I've I've been very aware of how much I need to eat on a bike and to always have more with you than you think you're going to need. That's always important. Don't go out with one bar and think I'll be a hero. Go out with two or three and come back with two spares if you're fine. Um, but don't, yeah, don't, don't cut it short, especially now when, let's be honest, a lot of places that might have been our go-to cafe stock, well, I mean, nowhere's open right now, but even, even in uh, lesser lockdown times, that they're not open because it's not been viable for them to, to survive this pandemic. So a lot of the places that you might have relied on stopping for a cake before, they're not open anymore. So make sure you've got extra, <laughs> extra nutrition with you. Yeah, definitely. And I think a few people have been caught out, haven't they, in the last few weeks, that's for sure. Yeah. So you touched on there in terms of race day planning. So let, let, let us get behind the scenes a little bit. So big, big, big race, you know, Olympics, World Cup, World Championships, big, big Ironman event, whatever it needs to be. Talk us through everything from, you know, your, your pre-race meal to you know, your nutrition throughout the race, just so that, you know, the audience there, whether they're a coach or, you know, a grassroots athlete, you know, a budding superstar, they can understand what it takes actually, you know, to, 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 to perform on the day. Sure. Well, I mean, I don't think there's actually anything too fancy about what I eat specifically kind of before races. Um, something that I've for a very, very long time done is um, try to have a pizza the night before a race, um, largely because pizza is pretty universal. You can find a pizza wherever you are in the world. Um, in the back streets of Hungary somewhere, you'll find a pizza place. So that's kind of why we've le lent towards that. Obviously, there's the, the carb content, the, the large calorie content that you'll get with a pizza, which is always beneficial the day before a race. But on top of that, it's the fact that it's easy to usually find one. Um, sometimes I'll have a pasta dish. We usually always go to an Italian, um, but more often than not, my go-to would be a pizza and that will be the night before a race. Um, race day itself depends a lot on whether we race morning or afternoon. Most um, age group races tend to happen in mornings, international elite races, some mornings, some very, very early mornings. Some Sometimes they make us wait till five o'clock in the evening. We're just sat around all day doing nothing, waiting to race in the dark. Um, so if I'm racing in the morning, it's pretty simple. Um, wake up, I usually try to eat between three, three and a half hours before the gun goes off. And I would have uh, pretty much porridge oats with honey and a banana um, and probably a couple of slices of toast with jam on. Pretty, all pretty simple carbs. Um, 
bit of sugar in there. Um, that's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty basic. Really often I take some of that with me if I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it where we, wherever we go. Um, pretty easy things to sort of pack in your, pack in your suitcase. Um, if we are racing later in the day, again, I'll have a pretty simple lunch, which will probably be some kind of, I'll have gone out and found some bread rolls and bananas and honey and that kind of stuff. Again, all really, really just simple stuff. Um, but then once we get sort of closer to the race, um, I actually use, um, I'm not even sure if these are available anymore. So I might be showing a discontinued product here. So I apologize in advance if I am. This one's a high five um, energy gel and aqua one, and it's a citrus flavor. I prefer the citrusy stuff on race day. Um, this one's got caffeine in it and so I'll take that pre-race but I don't use caffeine during the race um, like I said for me my stomach sometimes doesn't really tolerate it so with us trying to take a gel on the bike and hope that digests in time to, to then run it's just sometimes not worked out well for me personally but I know loads of people who swear by using caffeine on the bike you just kind of have to play around with it and sort of find out what works for you so yeah I tend to take a gel within the 45 minutes or so before before I start the race um, and then once I'm actually in the race, if it's an Olympic distance race um, on the bike, I'll have two full 750 bottles, 750 milliliter bottles. One will just be water just for the ease of um, just just kind of getting that down me. The other one will be energy powder. Um, and again, I either go for citrus, usually orange, actually, I prefer on, on race day. So one with energy powder, one with water. I try to get through both of those on the bike, and I'm pretty good at that. I've had to teach myself to be able to tolerate that. A liter and a half of water in your stomach doesn't always feel too nice but um i've managed to again train myself to do that i had to do a lot of in training before i could do it in a race um so that then i could get off and run 10k and not feel like i had a sloshy belly um and then i always have one gel on the bike oh, well that's not true sometimes i have two um and i use again i've got them over here somewhere i think uh these ones so this is just like a simple very high five gel um this one's got a higher density of carb in it than the other ones so you don't have to actually try and get as much down you to get as much carbohydrate out of it so I use those ones in the race and I have these taped to my top tube um I tend to have two largely because what if I drop one because when you're trying to get it off you know you've got it all like taped on or you've got it attached by elastic bands all the methods that we all use um in getting it off in the race often especially with us we race in packs so there might be something going on and you have to quickly remove your hand from your top tube and go back to your handlebars use your brakes something like that um I've, I've been known to drop a drop a gel every now and again so in case you drop one always have two and if the race is panning out to be what I would call an especially tough one so that could be something we might predict in advance because of the course um we know it's going to be a be a really hilly tough course or because the bike pace is really really on um I'll know that pretty early and then I'll take two so I might take one on say lap three out of eight we tend to have an eight lap course lap three out of eight and then another one on lap seven out of eight um and then on the run it's just grab a few water bottles at each station and that's it and that usually does me okay <laughs> but, but yeah and I think you're right on again I think it resonates is that trial and error because it's not it's not one size fits all is it some people need a little bit more some people a little bit less and certain certain gels agree with other people and it's only a case yeah, of absolutely for me for a sprint distance i actually don't use a gel um i don't feel like i need it my body for us it's, it's around an hour just under an hour of racing um if i've eaten well enough fueled enough well enough beforehand i don't find that i need the gel on the bike sometimes i'll have it there again just in case just in case i'm feeling that i might need something um but i rarely do whereas a lot of my competitors i'll see them in lining up in transition putting their bikes in and they will have a gel for a sprint distance so it is it's really individual yeah for sure and on that individual obviously you've got three disciplines so a bit of a round robin question which one's your favorite Oh, it's the running for me. I think um, it's the one I'm the most natural at, um, definitely, as I mean, I, I sort of touched upon that with my training before. Um, I don't have to, I'm, I'm lucky in that I don't have to run a huge amount to get quite good results out of it. Um, and then when I do get, you know, sort of when my coach, Reese, when he does let me sort of do the hard run sessions, it's almost like a real treat. I really love them. Um, my favorite sessions are still track sessions. I think I've still got that in me from being the little teenager who used to love going to the track. Um, that's still my absolute favorite. And I, I also really just love the simplicity of running. Um, 
riding's amazing that feeling of the the wind in your in your helmet or whatever you know as you're just on the free roads and the amount of sort of area you can cover and things you can see that's amazing and I love that but you have to be able to take your bike with you you have you know packing up your bike to go abroad is a pain in the backside whereas you only ever need a pair of run shoes and you can go from anywhere anywhere in the world and I, I, I've always loved that and I think I probably always will so, so I suppose it's, it's probably fair to say then that because running comes naturally to you that you, your biggest gains are always going to be in the pool or on the bike so it's yeah I think yeah I think that's absolutely fair I've swam for the longest um but swimming it's like if you look at the real top swimmers they kind of top out in their early 20s and here I am more than a decade on still trying to grasp on to that speed I had as a, as a teenager. Um, and I mean, I am lucky that I've got a background in swimming. I think it is increasingly hard to make it at the top of triathlon without some kind of background in swimming. Um, it has been done. There are many exceptions. Jan Frodeno is a, is a key one. He didn't start swimming until he was a bit older. Um, but it does help having a background in swimming. And for me, the biggest thing is almost just trying to hold on to the the swim speed that I've had the swim endurance that I've had as a youngster and if anything try and be as good as I was if I can get anywhere close to my 400 meter pb when we do time trials then I'm really chuffed because that you know that's the standard I need to be and I kind of just got to try and stay there um but on the bike it is something that I've never I've never been that natural at um really frustrating for me I try really hard <laughs> I do a lot of hours I do the work I do the hard sessions you know I do I do what I'm told to do and we've we've looked at every which way of doing it and it's just a fact for me that I just have to work really hard at that and some people don't some people that that's the one that comes naturally for them but for me I found a real love for it I found a real love for doing those hours and I had to because it was something that at first felt very daunting um, but yeah, I have, I found a, I found a love for riding and, um, yeah, I just have to keep plugging away. <laughs> I think there's a really strong message again for the, for the youngsters on the call that we, we, we can almost get a bias towards doing the things we're good at. Yeah. You know, and then, and then the nature of, I'm always moaning. I'm always, <laughs> moaning. why am I not allowed to go for a run? You know, some of the people I train with, um, they're on a completely different pro program to me and they'll be, oh yeah, I've got another run to do today. I'll be like, what? Why, why can't I go running? Why am I not allowed to go running? And I'll, I'll sort of take it up with Reese. And unfortunately, I've made a bit of a, a bed for myself because I did well early this year off not much running. Now he just turns around and says, well, you proved that you don't need to do that and that you do need to do this other stuff. So off you go, back on your bike. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally, yeah. You, yeah. You, um, you mentioned PBs earlier. So obviously for, P for PBs, you need to be measuring a lot of stuff regarding training and that. How often are you sort of, testing each element or and how how do you go about that it depends a lot you know we we don't do loads of it um we don't do much in the way of lab testing every now and again um i can't remember the last time i did any testing for running because you know not allowed um <laughs> i think he's worried that i'll push too hard and like break something because i'm getting old um so we do every now and again we'll do time trials in the pool um we did quite a lot of them last winter usually 400 sometimes a 1500 as well which is hideous um so we do a bit of that uh and then yeah but again over the winter we probably did three of each of those 400 and 1500 meter time trials and then then obviously everything happened so we didn't really get to the summer <laughs> we didn't really get to that point this year um and then with cycling stuff um loads of people chat about ftps functional threshold power we don't really do we don't really bother with that it's it's not that it's completely irrelevant but it is less relevant for what i do given that i race in a peloton essentially pack racing draft legal racing it's not simply about what power can you hold for a long period of time um it's about how do you react when you get taken above your threshold for two minutes um and then you've only got 30 seconds off can you sort of you dipping in and out can you recover in that time and that's essentially what we train to do um which is a bit different so even though we will do the odd uh the odd bit of testing on the bike every now and again a bit of um bit of sort of uh, power testing not very often we kind of use it just to gain a few figures see if we've made any improvements but yeah we don't we don't tend to rely on it quite as much as the people who might do either more long course racing or non-draft legal racing so, so when you're saying you're racing in a peloton i guess you know there's a lot of experience and tactics that come into that of knowing when to go when to stay as you said just to just to manage those energy levels 
definitely um technical ability is massive as well where you put yourself in the pack how you corner all those kind of things and it's um it's something I noticed this year with um a lot of the racing racing that happened was online racing uh, a lot of the Zwift stuff that we saw taking off what was really interesting was some of the people who were doing really well in those Zwift races I race against regularly and I wouldn't say they're particularly good on the bike um, and then some of the people who I would say they are the best cyclists in our pack, the strongest, the best technically, all the rest weren't doing as well. And you can argue many different reasons why that is. But I, I do think there is an element of you cannot show on Zwift what you can do outside on the road and how you ride in a pack and how you tactically um, deal with each situation that comes at you and how you corner and where you put yourself before the corner and all that kind of stuff. And that is a really, really huge part of what we do. Uh, and with that tactical, do you ever sort of research your, your opponents or, or is the, you know, the girls on tour, if you like, uh, such a close pack that you you roughly know each other's weeks and strength it is or do you jump on youtube watch videos and analyze especially maybe some of the youngsters are coming through yeah with the youngsters it's interesting as soon as someone kind of springs up and does a half decent result you kind of want to know where, okay where did they come from what's their real strength what that you know so you might do a little bit of research on them um in terms of a lot of the more you know main players the people you see all the time you kind of just know um, and no one tends to make a massive jump forward. It's always sort of increments. Every now and again, we get to the beginning of a new season and it might be, oh, all of a sudden this person's tons better than they were last year. How did that happen um, in terms of, okay, well, they must be load strong on the bike because they're running really well now off those hard bikes, which before they couldn't do. And so you kind of pick up on a few things like that. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I do go back and look at the races. So I watch them back. Um, uh, if I'm not at a race, I'll, I'll always watch it. Um, and then if I am at the race, I'll go back and watch it. And just kind of with Reese, my partner, my, my, my coach, um, we, we watch them and we kind of pick out things that might be interesting, important points, things that we noticed that someone did that really made a difference or someone that made a, oh, that was where they went wrong there. They should have done this differently. Um, so yeah, we, we do, we do pick it apart as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose it's just a really important tool, isn't it? And, and I think if if you're at grassroots and you haven't got the, the video footage, I think sometimes if you have got a coach, just just talking about the race and what you were thinking and what you were feeling at one time, because all that adds to that experience that you could take forward into to your future career at whatever level you're racing yeah, at. Definitely. We, um, something that British Triathlon have started doing for a little while now is they ask us to give bits of feedback to them. Um, what we think about how we race sort of um, takeaway points from it things that we think we did well things that we noticed things that we think we might need to address in our own training just stuff like that and so now pretty much whenever I'm traveling back from a race um, usually on a plane I sit there and I just make notes on my phone just kind of it's always good to do it usually within 24 to 48 hours of the race because it's sort of fresh in your mind but also I wouldn't do it straight after the race because everything's emotional then so no matter whether it's been good or bad, you kind of have got like a bit of a wave of emotion going on in you. So if you wait till the next day, usually that's when you tend to, well, for us in any way, when we tend to travel home, just give yourself 10 minutes to just kind of go through in your head what, what you think happened and what you think you can address going forward and, and, and points you can talk to your coach about, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that resonates with me as a performance coach where we're talking about reflective practice, really, you know, thinking back yeah. and, and taking the learnings and, just by doing that, you're eliminating the chance of making the same mistakes again, but also taking the, the good things that you've done and you're more likely to replicate them moving forward. Um, there's a there's a question coming from Chris regarding um, how do you remain sort of motivated through training, through winter, through hard blocks, etc. But there's a word you used very early on. And I don't know if it was conscious or not. You were talking about commitment rather than motivation. You know, I'm committed to this. I'm committed to this goal. And I need a goal to, 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 to work towards. Can you talk a little bit how you keep yourself committed to your goals and, and therefore motivated? Yeah, I think this is something that I really think is really individual. And I also, I it became really highlighted to me during lockdown because everyone was dealing with it differently. It made me think about, well, what's motivating them to go out and do 30 hours a week? And what's motivating that person to really hit three hard runs every week? And, you know, so it kind of made me, 
made me think about, well, why are certain people motivated by different stuff? And for me, I think it always comes back to the fact that I am hugely driven by major championships, specifically the Olympics. And I always have been. Um, I remember watching the Olympics when I was six years old. I watched the Barcelona Olympics on TV. I didn't understand a huge amount about it, um, but I did know that Lymphe Christie won and I did know that Sally Gunnell won. And I do remember jumping around my living room with excitement, sort of feeding off my parents, my mum especially, feeding off her excitement. Um, and I remember thinking, this is the coolest thing ever. And, you know, how, how amazing would it be to sort of do that? So for me, my whole life, really, nearly 30 years now, has been the Olympic Games, the Olympic Games. Um, and I'm very lucky to have found a sport that I consider a real life choice as well. I think triathlon is one of those, it's almost like a lifestyle that you live being a triathlete, um, just sort of oozes health and fitness and excessive exercise. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, it's, I, I have noticed from sort of looking at myself really quite deeply that I need a specific goal. I, I'm all in or I'm all out. I don't work well when I'm half assing it, frankly. Um, when I'm going at 80%, I might be relatively happy um, in myself on, on a day to day. And actually, I probably have a better functionality in day to day life. I, I can do normal tasks without having just a fog everywhere um, because I do definitely get to the point where I'm at full capacity to do anything. And it's pretty much just training. Um, but for me to achieve what I want to achieve. And I don't want to just race. I want to race well. Um, and I think that comes from having been quite good when you've been at the top of the sport. You don't want to then race and not be at the top of the sport. That's quite demoralizing. So I'm always motivated to be as good as I was. I'm always motivated by the Olympic Games. And I'm also motivated by seeing my peers. I see my peers come out and do really well after lockdown. And even though I know I still feel like I did the right thing for me, I'm jealous. I'm like, well, hang on, they, they, did, they did a better bloody job than me and now they're beating me. So what have I done? So I think, right, well, I've got to knuckle down now and go again. And, and something that someone once said to me again, it's a bit, of a bit of a quote, if you like, was if you're not out there training one of your competitors is. Um, and I gain a lot of confidence for me standing on a start line, knowing that there's virtually no other girls in the world that train as many hours as I do. There's not that many... Um, Olympic distance athletes that put in the 30 hours, you know, with the gym work and everything as well that I mentioned on top of those other hours before. Yeah, there's not that many people who who consistently do those kind of hours. And I stand on a start line and I look at the other girls and I'm like, I know what training you do because you put it all over Instagram. And I know what training you do because I see your Strava, you know, all of that. And I'm like, and I know I've done more hours than you. And that gives me a huge boost going, going into those races. And yeah, for me, there's, there's a few elements to that, I guess, to, to answer the, the question. It's not one thing, but having a goal is, is massive for me. There's, there's, um, there's a fine line, I think, in terms of, you know, you know, over your experience and all the competitions and majors you've, you've entered that you know what works for you when you, you know, you've come up with this 30 hours. So when you're on that start line, is it confidence in, in your dedication and the, the design of your training programme? and the hours because what i'm getting at, i think sometimes is that people can yeah. overtrain they can go out and do 40 50 oh, yeah. and that doesn't equate to they're going to win the race it's because they're probably overtrained and there's a fine yeah. balance isn't there there's a massive balance and like i said right at the beginning of this it's there's a real individual element that i know i am not a natural diesel engine when i have had vo2 max testing i don't have a great vo2 max that's just not who I am. Um, what I do have is really good run economy, which is why I get away with not doing massive run volume. But that doesn't help you on the bike. <laughs> so I know that I have to do this volume to try and get me to somewhere that someone else might only have to do 22, 23 hours a week and they'll be in exactly the same place as me. So I know that I've got to do something a bit different to other people. Um, there is absolutely a fine line and it's not 30 hours every week. Um, even now this block I've just done, I think um, my biggest week was 29. So I'm sort of just touching, touching 30 hours. Um, in the beginning of this year, when I was in Australia, I did this massive block where I think I did about six weeks and every week was over 30 hours bar one, which was my recovery week. And even that was about 27 or something, which was a hideous amount of hours. Um, but I came out of it really, really well. And that, that I'm sure would have stood me in really good stead for summer racing had it happened. Um, but equally, you've got to manage that with illnesses, 
injuries you know some people just couldn't do that their body would fall apart even if I look at the other girls that I race with from the, the Great Britain team Georgia is someone who races who trains sorry significantly less hours than me and always has done because she had a huge injury problem when she was in her late teens and early 20s and so she's always had to manage her volumes her run volume is really low but she again doesn't have to do the same quality of um, quantity of riding as me but she's a phenomenal rider and that's just how she's built and so she manages her she she's very in touch with her her own body as well she'll know if she's pushing a bit too hard whether she's not recovering enough day on day on day and we'll, t- we'll back it off and take tra- take take the rest and I'm the same yes I want to hit those 30 hours and that is a bit of a a bit of a magic number for me but if I have to back it off and do 28 that's still good you know that's still okay that's not it's not a disaster and yeah you really do have to balance it with with knowing when you are so close to the edge that it's not worth pushing on anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's that it's been on the start line and having the confidence that, you know, I, I co-created my program with my coach. I did all the sessions I was required. I'm hitting the numbers. You, you, it's that accumulation effect, isn't it? Yeah, Rather than just waking yeah. up one day and feeling good and I should be all right. Yeah, no, just saying that I did 30 hours for X amount of time. I wouldn't stand on the start line and feel the confidence from that. I'd have to have done hit good times and sessions, good powers, um, you know, that kind of stuff that would then all combined without having had to have hiccups through illness and injury and had to take a week off here and a week off there. That is what makes you stand on the start line and feel like I've been so consistent. I've improved in this area. I've hit this session. I've hit this amount of swim sessions in a row. Right. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Great. Great. I, um, I noticed you said earlier about bouncing off the walls with your mother watching the uh, Barcelona Olympics, etc. And um, Ciara's asked a question around what, what were you like growing up? Were you like turbo competitive? <laughs> Yes, is the honest answer to that. Yeah, I was. Um, I am the youngest child and um, I've got, well, there's three siblings. Um, two of them are a lot older. Um, so I, I guess I wouldn't say I really grew up with them, but they were around. Um, and then there's my brother who's two years older than me. And um, I joke about it all the time, but I used to compete with him over things he didn't even know he was, I was competing with him at, with him at. I, I used to compete with him over who could eat breakfast first. He didn't know it was a race, but I would beat him anyway. Um, and just stupid stuff like that. Whenever he had friends around and was playing races in the garden, I had to be involved. When he was playing cricket with his mates in the garden, I had to be involved. Um, yeah, he, he's the opposite to me. He's kind of laid back. So he'd just be like, it's my annoying little sister, but whatever. Um, and there was me just wanting to try and beat them at absolutely everything. And yeah, I guess I just always was. And I never, I never saw the issue with being competitive. Um, I remember being at secondary school, running at sports day, um, beating all the boys not caring being like yeah obviously I'll be the boys of course I'm quicker than them like who cares and that's that's just how I guess I've always been and I think I think now that I'm older I'm quite good at switching it on and off I know when to be competitive and when not to be and in training as a general rule I try and keep it really under wraps and I think I'm quite good at that I don't think it's good to be super competitive in training all the time for a couple of reasons one you'll probably hack off anyone that you train with um, you get a reputation and secondly you'll probably end up pushing that little bit too hard dipping over into the into the zone that you don't want to go in that's going to lead to the injuries and the illnesses um but yeah, I think day to day life now, I am quite good at keeping it under wraps and I sort of just unleash when it's time. <laughs> and it's great. And, you know, and, and again, as a coach, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, it's the old adage, isn't it? In the olden days, and I'm going to call it the olden days because those days are gone. <laughs> that that when, 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 a, when, a, when a boy or a man was, you know, competitive, then he was a natural leader. And if a girl did it, then she was bossy. Yeah. You know, it was the two yeah. sides. But actually that... that <laughs> that equality of course we could be competitive but it's 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 the time and the place of that isn't it i think that that's really really important so so yeah. thanks very much for that i think what we're going to do is we've only got 10 minutes left so we're going to we're going to try and whistle whistle stop tour through um, i'll try and be quicker with my answers sorry yeah, yeah. Um, so uh we've got harry on the call as well who's really strong cyclist and swimmer but really struggling to improve his running um any tips on improving his running without affecting obviously his cycling and swimming so running is usually one that will get better if you just run. It's, it's probably the one of the three that if you just run, you'll probably get better. That said, 
any improve any increases in your volume do them steadily never go more than about a 15 percent increase in, in a week don't go more than that um try and build the volume a little bit but another thing i'd say is try and do some drills um plyometrics i think are amazing i did plyometrics from when i was um in my early teens and I don't know if it's done as much anymore but I really think it's something that you can learn you can get that reactivity at a younger age it's quite hard to teach when you're older um so if you can get some some plyometric drills in there I think they're they're really useful that contact time off the floor is um is, is vital brilliant thank you uh Gemma's asking we've touched on your nutrition but how how far in the details do you go do you sort of track your macros and things like that when when you're in season or off season I have to say, I absolutely do not. No, I, I don't go into that at all. I very much believe in a balanced all round diet. There's been times in my life where I've been a lot more restricted, largely due to coaches, bad advice here and there. Um, and it never worked out very well for me. And the happiest, healthiest and leanest I've ever been has just been eating a very normal balanced diet nothing's banned um nothing is demonized it's all you know it is fine to have that piece of cake do not stress it um especially as a triathlete god how much do we train like come on um it's not worth it and um, yeah you know when i'm not training as much i'll naturally eat a bit less because guess what i'm not as hungry um and if i am having an easier week then every now and again i might say okay i probably have a biscuit less today um but my body is quite good at telling me what it needs and as i've got older the one thing i'm really good at now is listening to it whereas for a good number of years I didn't listen to it. I listened to the other voices telling me I had to be this weight or I had to try and do this. I had to stop eating fats or sugars or whatever. Now I eat a bit of everything and it's fine. <laughs> that's great. There's, there's a few comments already saying that's great to hear. And I think there's an element of paralysis by analysis that because some of the high-end elite athletes break things down, that it, put, yeah. it transcends and put a bit of pressure on the young athletes today. And I think the key message really, and what I was hearing from you earlier, is that as young athletes, just go and enjoy yourself. Go and run, go and swim, go and ride your bike and go and enjoy You've it. To. You've absolutely got to. This is a hard sport, right? It's a really fun one. And like I said, it can be your lifestyle, which is amazing, but it's hard. And if you don't find a way to enjoy it, you don't have the right people around you, you don't have the right program, the right coach, the right friends and training partners, you're never going to stick at it. And it's a sport that rewards longevity. It rewards staying in it for a long period of time, being consistent over a long period of time. You can't do that if you're not if you're not having fun. So you've got to find a way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there's another one coming in talking about that. Is, um, what other things do you do in and around your training to improve performance? So prehab, rehab, you know, stretching and things like that. Is, is there anything you do sort of religiously? Yeah, um, I have had a couple of major injuries, usually um, usually things with fascia, so the surrounding of the muscle rather than the muscle sheath itself. That tends to be any injury I've ever had tends to be in some way related to the fascia. Um, so there are certain things that I have to make sure I do. Um, I've had real fascia problems in both my feet and my calves. So a lot of calf raise work. Um, I'm pretty religious about my gym work, actually. Um, it's something that I think endurance athletes tend to neglect a little bit. Um, I never have done really, not for oh, a good eight years or so now. I've been really, really hot on making sure my gym work is in there. Um, don't be afraid to lift weights. That's a complete myth as well, that that's going to make you turn into some kind of powerhouse that's just muscly everywhere and big. Um, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I, I really believe in the power of the gym for both um, improvements, actually. I really think you can improve in, in sport from being strong in a gym, but I also believe it's really important in your, in your prehab, prehab work. Um, I've got a, you can't see it's behind the screen here, but I've got a really lovely foam roller, a, a, a nice pointy rumble roller, which is always good for ironing out a few things. Um, I try to see a physio at least once a week. Um, at the moment, that's a bit more tricky. Um, but again, I know the sort of things in my body that tend to tighten first. I know the areas, if something's tight, I know that could lead to a, a warning sign. So I'm very, I'm very in tune with knowing the areas. If that, if, if for example, my left foot starts to get tight, we got to sort that pretty quick. That's not something we can leave. Um, and there's just a few other things like that. If I start to find that I'm struggling to breathe in harder sets in the pool, that usually means that my ribs are tight. So we start doing work on those as well so and the ribs tend to knock everything out sort of from up down so you know if I if I have a bump on the head that often affects me all the way down the chain as well that's a fascial thing 
So they're just little things that I, I pick up on and I notice. Um, I'm very quick to get into the physio if I think there might be something wrong. Um, I'm not afraid to take a day off, um, especially from running, um, because it's the most impact, the most the hardest on your body. If you do feel something coming on, then I'm very quick to say I won't run today. Um, and yeah, just knowing the difference between something being a little bit tight and something being wrong, because yeah. there is times the difference there oh absolutely and most athletes that, that resonate when they you always feel a little bit uncomfortable it's different being uncomfortable and being injured and you soon learn learn the difference yeah, don't you you do and that's just you just learn okay last couple of quick fire ones then have you got a favorite snack oh have i got a favorite snack okay outside of high five we won't go we won't we, i won't i won't plug high five too much uh, <laughs> um favorite snack i enjoy i enjoy malt loaf and i also love a mince pie great time of season for that isn't it great time oh, yeah. of they're, they're everywhere at the minute i can't get away i from know <laughs> market. um was there any point in your career where you thought about quitting Yes, actually there was. I came very close to sort of jacking it all in when I was about 23, my first year out of university. I was sort of really struggling. I'd left um, Loughborough, which is where I was at uni. I'd left the setup there. I was trying to sort of do it on my own. Didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I think I came last at national championships that year. Um, I just had a real kind of moment of why am I doing this? Am I going to make it? Um, I'd been a very good teenager and especially running, but also in swimming. And then it was like, well, do I want to do this and be really not as good as I think I can be? And um, I ended up at that point kind of having a bit of a crossroads moment. Do I kind of leave it, jack it in? Or do I really go 100 percent? I'm, I'm a triathlete now. I'm not a, I'm not a student anymore. I'm not doing this half half baked. I'm doing this properly. And I chose that path. I joined an international training group and never looked back. <laughs> Last two questions then. So is, is, this is an amalgamation of a few. Uh, we sort of touched on it actually before the call. Um, obviously, a lot of young girls in sport at the moment, and there's a lot of things around, you know, body confidence, etc. Uh, is there something that, you know, y any advice you would give them that maybe when they're going out for a run and they're wearing their, their physical activity kit or everything, that maybe give them some top tips? Or is there anything you've suffered with? I wouldn't say there's anything I've suffered with, but I think I'm I'm almost immune to it. I don't think I would care or even notice. Um, and I think that is just from years and years of doing it. Um, I started running in my parents' field outside our house when I was about 11. Um, and I did used to feel a bit like, oh gosh, the cars can see me when I'm doing laps in this field, they must think I'm crazy. Um, but I just got used to it and I just didn't care. And now I actually think, you often think people are looking at you when maybe they're not. Um, I think maybe they're just, they're just clocking a runner, but they're not bothered about you being a runner or they're not thinking, oh gosh, what are they doing being a runner? Um, and I think just hold your head high. I think most people will just think, oh, good on and they're going for a run. I see people running all the time and I see people running and I think they look so uncomfortable and they look like they're hating it. And I think, good on you, good on you for doing this. I know it's hard, but well done. And I think a lot of people are probably thinking that as well. Um, I've never been in a position where I've been made to feel really hideously uncomfortable, but I would always say if you have been, then maybe try running with a friend um try try linking up with someone just just while you sort of build your confidence up for running even if you're starting running that's a great tip try and run with a friend um and in terms of sort of clothing choices and that run what you are comfortable in do not give two hoots what anyone says do what works for you the right clothing that makes you comfortable wear that yeah good point and last one then so obviously all eyes on the prize olympics next year well um, you've, you've announced apparently that you plan on retiring is that correct Oh, uh, well, I, I, yeah. I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. Because the question was, what's the plans after the Olympics? But it, yeah. it, the door might be open. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm coming to the end, shall we say, but I don't know exactly when the end's going to be. Uh, uh, it's not something that I want to do for the next 10 years. Um, I have loved the life that I've had through triathlon, the opportunities it's afforded me. I met my husband through triathlon. You know, it's so many great things through this sport. I'd like to give back to it a little bit in some way. Haven't quite worked out exactly how yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think... 
within the next two years, probably, uh, maybe this time next year, don't know. In terms of immediate plans after the Olympics, um, I'm going to have another wedding because I had a lockdown wedding. Um, so I'm going to have one where all my friends and family can come, which I'm quite looking forward to. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to go on an epic honeymoon somewhere. I uh, haven't decided where yet. So those are the really important things that I'm going to do after the Olympics and anything else is sort of up for up for negotiation <laughs> brilliant vicky thanks very much i mean i think i, I think i said this last time i spoke to you could speak for hours and uh, i know that's me i'm so sorry <laughs> uh, all. No, all. i tell you it's one of the easiest ones to give that's why sometimes it's like pulling teeth but i've only uh, it was great what i like to do guys before we wrap it up is bring Gemma back in from high five it's going to share a little bit of information around some of the programs that high five have got up and running and then i'll be back in just to wrap it all up so over to you Gemma. um yeah well i think i said a lot of my bits at the beginning but um basically that was really good thanks guys thanks both of you for doing that that was uh, really insightful actually i've learned a lot about triathlon myself now which is quite interesting um i just wanted to say thank you for everybody who attended today and um you know feedback is very welcome so if anybody wants to get in touch with me over email or on the phone i'm happy to talk to you and hear some ideas or suggestions for what we could do next time this is the first of these that we've done so it's a you know a bit of a bit of a trial run for us as well um so feedback is very welcome and um please follow us on social media and things like that and look out for perhaps some clips from this event that might be shared at times and yeah that's pretty much it so best of luck in the olympics vicky and thanks everyone thanks phil Cheers, Gemma. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, Vicky. Thanks, as always. Um, hopefully, we look forward to seeing everybody at the next one. Cheers, guys. Have a lovely evening. Stay safe. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in, everyone. <laughs>